Hello, inquirers. A quick note before today's podcast for inquiry. The Center for Inquiry Canada is a proud sponsor of BahaCon, the Blue Water Atheists, Humanists, and Agnostics Conference happening in Sarnia, Ontario on August 26th through 28th, 2022. I will be going, and you can too, by registering at bluewateraha.com. I hope to see you there. And now, today's PFI episode. Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers? We have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. On today's episode of Podcast for Inquiry, I will be speaking with John Gleason, the godless engineer. He is a software engineer and online atheist content creator and activist. His content includes discussions about atheism, history, politics, science, and where those topics intersect. His goal is to critically analyze apologist claims to give people the best arguments and information to inspire them to stand up and use their voices. We talk about his journey to atheism and whether Jesus was a man or a myth. We discuss how he chose his audience and who it should be and how he strives to be both memorable and entertaining. We talk about how he selects what videos to dissect and analyze on his YouTube channel and how his activism has affected both his career and family relations. And finally, he gives some advice to activists who are just starting out on their online journey. I bring you today my conversation with John Gleason. John Gleason, thank you for coming on to Podcast for Inquiry today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here. I mean, I, I like what... Um, you know, the, the Center for uh, Inquiry uh, Canada does just in general. So I'm really excited to uh, be a part of, uh, of the podcast here. Now, you have a significant online presence. And while you don't hide your name, you go by the moniker Godless Engineer. So that name sounds like it has a, a good story behind it. How did you come up with that? And, and why did you decide to use it to promote your uh, your your podcast, your YouTube channel, your your website, and so on. I guess it does kind of have an interesting story behind it. Uh, when I initially started out, I um, I had been atheist for a little bit, and I had just finished up my master's degree in software engineering, and I I decided to you know be a little bit more vocal uh, about my new worldview that I'd come into that included atheism. And so what I wanted to do was um, try to be unique, uh, give sort of a, or have at least a unique sort of name. And so I just did a little bit of research about it, like on Facebook, because, um, you know, family members, they weren't exactly um, as uh, interested in hearing about my new worldview as, as I was about talking about it. So I decided to create a Facebook page for it. And so when I was looking for a name, um, I, I I knew that I wanted to label it as like something engineer because the, the the atheist activism or or my, my new worldview was sort of one of the big things that I was really focused on. Uh, Just, it was like new, interesting to me at the time. This was about 2012, uh, I guess, 10 years ago now. Um, it was about 2012. And so I was really interested in exploring it and everything like that, but I was also still very interested in like my engineering career. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, that was one of the defining traits about myself. I felt was being an engineer. I was very proud of it since I just got my software engineering, uh, master's degree. And so I, I thought atheist engineer, no, nah, I don't want to just be another atheist person. So I was thinking of like, you know, words that mean that, that convey 
the idea that I didn't believe in a God. And so I came up with jobless engineer. That wasn't necessarily taken. Um, I think on Facebook, I came up with godless engineering and uh, I really wasn't wanting to let it go. So I just stuck with godless engineer. And luckily most, most social media um, platforms don't have somebody that already has godless engineer on it. So I was able to, to snatch up uh, that particular username pretty much anywhere, anywhere that I go. So, um, but that's, that's pretty much how I came up with it. Um, you know, I had family members that didn't really want to hear about my new worldview and I was talking about it uh, a lot. Like I was interacting with posts and everything like that. And so I just decided to create a Facebook page as an outlet. And that's how I, I, uh, you know, got them, the, uh, I guess the moniker or whatever, um, godless engineer you mentioned that you came to your godlessness uh shortly after your master's degree so that would have put you into your your mid-20s or so how did you how did you come to atheism how did you arrive at that conclusion how did that become your worldview uh in in your mid-20s that's uh, not a common time for people to make a, a big shift in how they view the world yeah uh, well, I mean, to be quite honest, like I had never really, uh, considered, uh, what I actually believed and, and why I believed it. So, uh, you know, I grew up, um, Catholic for the longest time. And then I had around, uh, eight or nine years old, uh, my mom left the Catholic church. And so then we were kind of in this sort of, um, limbo, I guess you could say, between different um, religious denominations. And I eventually uh, found my way into uh, non-denominational churches as well as Southern Baptist churches, just, you know, trying to, I guess, live up to the whole idea of being a good Christian boy. Uh, You know, I always had this sense, uh, you know, of myself of like, well, you know, to be a good person, you should believe in God and you should go to church. And so with that in mind, like I always struggled with it growing up and, uh, but, but I still held to believing in God and it, it wasn't until much later uh, when I, I guess, you know, either social media or just being exposed to uh, people of different beliefs, you know, I started to really um, think about what I believed and why I believed it. And it, it, what, what one very big uh, pivotable uh, p- pivot <laughs> sorry <laughs> pivot, pivotal moment in my life was uh, I had a friend after a church softball game tell me that like you're not really a Christian unless you believe in the Bible from cover to cover like everything's literally true and I I knew that I didn't believe that. Uh, I knew that I like I didn't believe that Noah was real. Like I, I believed that when I was a kid, when I was told that those things were real, but I, I didn't believe in in most of the Old Testament um, and and everything like that. And so at that point, it was kind of like a light switch. Like I knew that I wasn't like a fundamentalist Christian, but right. you know I had to really examine for myself. Well, what did I believe? So you you still you, you were still open to the possibility of being what I've heard called a cafeteria Christian a little bit of this a little bit of that. Well, I, I guess so. Um, I, I I was I was open to you know the idea that the Christian God existed. I just didn't know exactly what I believed about him. Okay. And so I I sort of did I guess what you could call soul searching on it. I, I just I just really I thought very intensely about the question about why I believed. And I started looking into the reasons why people think God exists and the reasons why, uh, you know, people believe in, in the Christian religion and everything. And I I just didn't find the answers all that compelling. And so, uh, you know, I, I finally came, it came to the point where I had to, you know, um, come to the decision as to whether or not I believed in God. And, uh, being a very analytical person myself, with the exception of, you know, believing in God, I just couldn't find myself 
you know, believing in God anymore. So the, the hardest thing for me to do was to admit to myself that I was an atheist because it had been ingrained in me, you know, ever since I was young that, you know, good people believe in God and to be a good person, you've got to do what God says. You got to, you know, basically the whole, what would Jesus do kind of line. And so, you know, I, I just, I, uh, I, I just came to the conclusion that I didn't believe anymore. And, you know, I, after that point, like, I just, I didn't feel guilty about not going to church. I didn't feel guilty about not being interested in church. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I felt a lot of guilt that it, it shouldn't have been guilt in the first place. Uh, you know, like I, I shouldn't have felt guilty about these things. And I no longer did because, you know, I was like, well, you know, if I don't believe in God anymore, then, you know, I don't have to worry about church or I don't have to worry about appeasing this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, God, uh, this deity. Uh, and so it it really did lift a lot off of my shoulders and a, and a lot of worries that I had. And, um, you know, ever since then, uh, every time I've looked into like the reasons why God exists, uh, I just, I am similarly not uh, convinced. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm not all that, um, I, I guess, uh, persuaded, you know, by the arguments. And, and ever since, ever since then, you know, I've always sought out different views like different arguments to see what why people believe you know that a god exists and um i've been doing that for over 10 years now and uh all of the arguments are still just as poor as they were when i first considered them um but uh but yeah so uh, basically it was a long process that eventually led up to the point where i had to admit to myself that i didn't believe in a god anymore i went through a a similar journey a number of years ago, and uh, what I what I discovered is that there haven't been any new arguments either in favor of or against the existence of God for thousands of years. This debate has been going on for so long, and I'm not going to contribute anything new to it. And I don't think uh, I don't think anyone has in thousands in in thousands of years. They've just updated old arguments to make them relevant to current audiences. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll come. I'll come back. I, I want to ask a little bit more about about your YouTube videos and and your sort of general online style. But there's one you cover a lot of topics on your YouTube channel, and there's one in particular that I I kind of want to get into in in a little bit of depth because mm -hmm. it kind of surprised me when I when I first heard about that. So, uh, like you, I'm a non-believer, and I figured that the I figured that the New Testament was essentially an exaggeration, uh, especially when it came, when it comes to Jesus, right? He, uh, but I just figured, okay, there was a Jewish carpenter who was a nice guy. He went around preaching that people should be nice to each other. And then the story got kind of blown up into the whole resurrection and son of God, son of God bit. But, but you, you, uh, you espouse a very different perspective. And I think, I think you call it Jesus mythicism, which is a mm -hmm. bit of a mouthful, but what what that means is that Jesus never existed. Full stop. It was it's uh, uh, it's it's just a it's just a made up story, and I, I I'm hoping that you can expand on that and how you came to that and and why you think that's true versus uh, you know uh, I, what I think is the more common belief of. Uh, or just more the default assumption that the the biblical story might be grounded in some truth with the supernatural elements being exaggerations. Right. Well, uh, so I wouldn't say as like a as like a Gnostic position, I guess you could say of I know that Jesus didn't exist, or like a hard line sort of Jesus definitely didn't exist. I, I take more of a probabilistic approach to it. And in that I say that he probably didn't exist. I think that there's still a chance that he, he did, uh, but we just simply don't have the evidence to actually suggest that he did. So um, it, it's not as, uh, at least my position, there are plenty of people out there that take a more hardline position on it, but I'm, I'm very technically how I would phrase it is Jesus probably didn't exist is how I, I typically uh, describe it. But uh, how I came to that position um, is actually, uh, you know, I was I, I, I totally accepted the idea that, you know, there Jesus was just a minimal 
uh, historical type of figure, right? Uh, that Jesus um, was some kind of carpenter or mad apocalyptic preacher or something like that that wandered around places and, you know, um, uh, did uh, either either was perceived to do miracles or or whatever. But, um, you know, in in my in my time as, uh, you know, interacting like on social media platforms in groups and, and discussing things with other atheists or discussing things with other Christians, um, I, I came upon the position of, well, Jesus probably didn't exist in the first place. Or, or I guess it was more the hardline Jesus never existed kind of uh, position. And I was like, no, there's got to be evidence that he existed. I mean, we've got evidence of other people. So, I mean, there's got to be evidence that he existed. And so I I started looking into what the evidence actually is for Jesus's existence. And I was surprised to find uh, how little evidence we actually have of Jesus existing, considering the amount of documentation we have about Jesus that comes later, you know, that comes afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I was incredibly surprised as to how little um, information we actually have about uh, whatever historical person there might be. And so I I started researching it, looking into it and everything like that. And I found authors like David uh, Fitzgerald um, who, you know, wrote a, a book, uh, 10, 10 Christian or 10 myths about Jesus. Or, it's nailed. 10 Christian myths about Jesus or or something to that effect. And, you know, I read that and, and a lot of things that he said in there made a lot of sense uh, with the explanations. And, uh, but, but I didn't just read like uh, his book because of course there's Richard Carrier that, uh, you know, wrote an actual um, peer reviewed monograph uh, about the question uh, on the historicity of Jesus and uh i read i read his book too but but not only did i read their books their works their opinions but i also read the dissenting opinions against them and what i found was similar to how when i went looking for evidence that god exists or the arguments that god exists or the reasons why i should believe in god i found similarly poor uh, arguments for you know saying that jesus existed and um you know, it, it's easy to sit there and be like, oh, well, of course, there had to be some guy. And and it's easy to say that, but it's harder to, like, have the evidence and, and prove that that kind of guy existed. And so, you know, as I was, I was looking into both sides of the argument, um, I found the mythicist side to be more convincing than the historicist side. Uh, the mythicist side, at least in my view, is less ad hoc. It requires less um, assumptions about uh, different pieces of information. Um, and it, it definitely um, seems to, at least on the scholarly level that mythicism exists, it uh, requires a lot less bias in the scholarship. It, it, at least uh, that's what I've seen. So, that's why I, I came to the conclusion that Jesus probably didn't exist. It's just simply due to the lack of evidence that uh, a man uh, started the religion of Christianity and then, it, you know, the religion just sort of grew up after his death. Um, I don't think that there's like enough evidence to, su- to support that particular claim. So I, I, I would imagine that a, at least a simplistic argument against that would be, well, it's been 2000 years records were incomplete even at the time and many have been lost in the intervening years so a demand for direct contemporary evidence might be un- unreasonable there's you know you know vast majority of people that were alive at the time we don't have historic information for why why should it be different with jesus i, I imagine that this is an argument that that you've heard that you have found unconvincing i'm just wondering if you you know, could address that. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, so I don't expect like records that like, like I don't exactly expect records that are explicitly like, Hey, Jesus lived at this point in time and whatever, what we're looking for are, you know, like the incidental information that you can't really uh, find an alternate explanation for other than 
Jesus was a historical figure, you know? So like there were, um, there, there were plenty of people that were writing about, uh, you know, failed messiahs or messiahs in general. And, um, what we find is that they don't describe generally, you know, anything that comes close to what we would consider to be the Jesus figure that supposedly started Christianity, or at least that was crucified, uh, by, uh, somebody in order to start, you know, the, um, the religion. And one of the most notable ones I can think of that should say something, if Jesus was a historical figure would be Paul. Um, and there are a few vague verses that could be indications of historicity, but also um, I feel like the arg- like like the counter arguments to that coming from the mythicist side are are far more um, uh, they're 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 far more convincing, you know, from the mythicist. Can you summarize what you know what Paul said and why the mythicists mm-hmm. are more convincing? Like, like, be brief, but give give a fair analysis because right. not everyone is familiar with what Paul would have said or what the, what the counter arguments would be. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, so for one thing, like in Galatians one, uh, we have, uh, not only Paul separating himself out from any kind of historical sourcing. Um, but, uh, we also have him mentioning the brother of the Lord, but the problem with that particular verse is that, uh, Paul uses fictive kinships, uh, all over the place in order to reference other Christians. And the way that that particular phrase is constructed makes it seem more like a fictive kinship uh, when he's referring to James in that passage rather than um, like an actual blood relative. Um, And Paul uses the same word that he uses there for brother in other areas to reference uh, well, all areas to reference fellow Christians. Um, There's uh, another verse in Galatians 4, 4, where uh, Paul mentions, you know, uh, that Jesus was born of a woman. He doesn't say Mary, but like born of Mary or anybody in particular, but just born of a woman. But the problem with that is, is that the way that Paul references Jesus's birth there and in all other places is completely different from how he references literal human births. And he uses a completely different word for it and everything like that. So, uh, it it makes more sense to me that he's not referencing a literal uh, um, uh, a literal birth there just by on you know how he's how he's using the words. Uh, there's also the fact that that particular part's encased in a larger allegory, so this is an allegorical mother. Um, there's there's uh, things like that in Paul where it should be unambiguous that Jesus was a historical figure. Um, we're not expecting, you know, like detailed accounts of his ministry or anything like that. But we do expect at least Paul, the nearest contemporaneous uh, author that was writing uh, uh, the closest that we can get after Jesus supposedly died. He never references Jesus uh, being on earth in unambiguous way. And and how long was it between the death of Jesus and when and when Paul was writing? Well, excuse me, the, the supposed death of Jesus and, and when right. Paul was writing. Well, it, it's about 20 years. Um, and so uh, the, the, but a, a lot of Christian apologists and scholars will date uh, Paul's um, conversion to sometime in the thirties. So, uh, you know, by the time that Paul is writing things down in the fifties, uh, he's been a Christian evangelist for a long time. But if, if, Paul had this concept of Jesus as a historical figure, you would think that he would mention something unambiguously that it can't be explained any other way other than Jesus lived on earth. And uh, like I said, I I feel like all of the instances in Paul that are ambiguous references to Jesus, like existing in some kind of fashion, I feel like they're all more likely to be talking about a celestial form of Jesus rather than a historical form of Jesus. I think that's that's fascinating. And, and you know, when I uh, found your YouTube channel, and I watched a few of the videos. I was like, I never really thought about that, but it does make sense. Why did I assume that Jesus, like the, the baseline that it, that the Bible is based on it, based on a true story is what uh, so many Hollywood 
picture say. So of course there's exaggerations and distortions because I, uh, I don't take the Bible at face value, but I didn't, I didn't throw it, throw it all out. So, uh, I'm glad that there are people like you and, and the scholars that you cited that are doing the, the, the detailed work of, of actually looking at as close to firsthand sources as possible and, 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 and doing that analysis. So thank you. Oh yeah. And I don't expect everybody to be all that interested about it either. Like, Cause there's, there's a lot of people that are like, well, I don't really care if he was historical. What really matters is whether or not he was divine. And I mean, I, I can agree on, on, on a particular perspective. I can agree with that because if you're looking to just discuss and talk to like Christians that are out there uh, pushing certain ideologies, then yeah, I would not suggest bringing this up a, a whatsoever. And, and Jesus's divinity is obviously more important, but when, when you move past that particular group and you get into the more, uh, academic side of of this particular question about the history of Christianity, um, things like Jesus's existence or the facts that we supposedly know about Jesus's existence on Earth, um, like like the idea that he was born in Bethlehem or he comes from ne- Bethlehem or he comes from Nazareth and all this other stuff, things like that. Uh, it, it's re- it really only matters when you get to the academic level of discussion when you're talking about these things. And to be quite honest, I feel like the um, the more valuable discussion is to be had between atheists themselves, because there's there's uh, two distinct sides to it, and that's you know the mythicist side and the historicist side. And of course, um, you know Christian apologists out there are going to argue for the more magical version of Jesus, but they're obviously going to argue. Um, you know, on the on for the historical Jesus, uh, given that presumption of you know the the magical Jesus is is the real Jesus that exists, and so ha- having the discussion between atheists lets you cut past you know the the magical forms of Jesus, the magical ideas about Jesus, and uh, really get to the, the you know what what would be considered the minimal. Uh, historical Jesus. And I think that's where the, the um, discussion gets really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And although I think there's also going to be a large number of atheists. It's like, well, if we can all agree that the, uh, uh, the magical Jesus is imaginary, then it doesn't much matter if there was just a guy walking around talking or, or not like, you know, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, it doesn't, <laughs> that, that, that's not that's not important if we're really talking about atheism it matters if you're a historian and, and want uh, an accurate representation of what what happened 2000 years ago well yeah and i mean you could use the exact same argument though uh for like um moses and the other patriarchs of the old testament like uh you know uh, Mo- moses and all of them they were magical in their own ways and um, not not as magical as Jesus, obviously, but th- they were supernatural in their own ways. And um, I I don't think like for for the discussion of whether or not the Old Testament is historical, I don't think you have to go as far as to say, oh well, Moses or Abraham they didn't exist. I think you could definitely like maybe assume that they existed and still be able to disprove the historicity of the Old Testament, but. Uh, again, when when you get on the more academic level, uh, the current consensus in Old Testament studies right now and in historical studies is that Moses and the other patriarchs uh, did not exist or most probably just did not exist. And so I, I feel like, um, you know, as time progresses, mythicism will also follow that route of, you know, as as new generations of scholars come up and are trained and they, they identify the bad arguments, I think that will lean more in a direction of maybe agnosticism. I've watched a number of your YouTube videos, and uh, I think it's fair to describe you not only as an atheist, but as an anti-theist. Your style is quite in your face, almost uh, confrontational as you debunk a seemingly endless number of uh, Christian apologists or those attacking atheism. Do you find that this approach works and is effective? And I ask because I've chosen a very different style of engagement, and I'm and I'm genuinely curious, not having not having gone down the road that that you've traveled for the past ten years. Yeah, 
Well, I, I mean, starting out uh, it, with with my activism, I guess I was uh, I was a lot more in your face, and I mean, uh, on occasion now, I still kind of have that sort of um, demeanor, but um, I, I I feel like most when you start doing content and, and and stuff like that on social media platforms and everything like that, you really have to consider like what audience are you looking to. Um, I guess capture like what audience are you speaking to? And so I decided very, I get, well, somewhat early on about midway through, uh, I decided that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to convince religious people. Uh, like I wasn't trying to convince religious people to leave their faith. I wasn't trying to convince, uh, religious people really about anything. Um, uh, what I was looking to do was, in inform atheists about bad arguments but do it in a way that's memorable and that is entertaining and um i was uh, so i was really looking to hit that target audience of people that are already atheists but they're curious about you know the different arguments for and against god and they they they're interested in defending their own position and so I try to speak in a way that doesn't, I, I guess that won't necessarily cut out like all religious people. Um, you know, th there are religious people that my content's definitely not for, but then, then again, there are some religious people that um, still watch my content. Uh, even, even some of my more, um, I guess, um, energetic content. Uh, <laughs> Where where I go a little bit harder about it, um, and uh, but but my main focus is 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 to bring up good arguments for atheists to be better educated on like why why does the contingency argument not make sense or why does the intelligent design argument not make sense and the various aspects of that. But I try to do it in a way that people are entertained but also walk away feeling like they've either gain some kind of new knowledge or they're at least entertained in hearing the same regurgitated things that, you know, apologists constantly come up with. And so that, that has really been my goal. And with that in mind, I, sometimes I get a lot more firebrandy than other times. Uh, you know, with my mythicism content, I try to be a bit more professional and I'm not, not so energetic necessarily but um, I, I still have my personality in it. And, and uh, you, you had said that I'm uh, kind of an anti-theist uh, in a way. And um, I, I definitely agree with that because I, I feel like any belief that doesn't comport with reality has the potential to be harmful. And I don't want people to succumb to those kind of beliefs. I don't want people to be put in a position where they believe in things that, you know, could potentially harm them. And while my particular brand or, or my particular way of presenting the information doesn't um, I, I attract a lot of religious people, it definitely uh, speaks to a number of atheists out there and, and they're entertained by it. But more importantly, I hope that they retain some of the information and then they can, you know, pr provide that kind of argumentation or that kind of information to people that they see in their daily life, people that they're more likely to, um, you know, uh, people that they're more likely to change their mind or at least provide information that they will sincerely consider because, I mean, I, I know for me, if I have somebody that is a religious person that just comes right out the gate preaching their message, you know, to me, I can easily dismiss that person. Just like people can easily dismiss some guy on the Internet that, you know, is spouting some kind of anti-Christian or anti-religious rhetoric. They can easily dismiss me. But for people in their lives that are atheists that can you know sort of connect with them on a different level i think providing that person with good arguments against them um or at least good arguments to bring to the table to really make them think um 
I, I feel is a, um, you know, is, is a better focus for me and my channel. And um, I, I definitely present things in different ways. I already mentioned how with the mythicism topic, I present in a very different way than I do with, uh, you know, other topics. But I also try to have discussions on my channel where I show how I interact with religious people in general. And, and I try to do that as a way of providing a, a good example for people to see a, as to how you should interact with uh, religious people. I, you know, I'm an anti-theist, but I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I guess, um, angry towards Christians in general. Like, I can still, I'm an anti-theist, but I can still sit down and have an intelligent conversation with a a religious person. It's the, it's the idea that you want to squelch. You don't harbor animosity towards the people that, that right. hold that idea close to them. Right. And, and I, I try to be, I try to set a good example for people to have good productive conversations with, with Christians and show that you can absolutely detest the idea of religion and and what religion says, what religion causes people to do, or rather what people do uh, because they think religion teach, teaches them or tells them to do something like that. You, you can absolutely detest that, but you can still treat people with, you know, I guess, I guess re respect people in a conversation to where you're possibly going to reach them. And so while, while I present some information in a more educational entertainment sort of way that'll really get their attention, I also try to show that, you know, you don't need to treat religious people as if they're just automatically stupid or anything like that. You, you, you should treat people um, with as much respect as, as you can until they give you a reason not to treat them with respect. And, and even then, though, I think that you should still like just respectfully not engage i guess uh if if you feel like you can't uh you know sit there and and have a conversation without looking like the evil guy then um you should probably not have the discussion um and and there's probably other people that can sit there and have a good con uh discussion with them without uh, looking like the evil atheist you know and so I, I, I try I try to be a good example of that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes, you know, I fall uh, and and, um, you know, I just pick myself up and I learn what not to do, what, when to definitely say no to a conversation. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to. I, I try to uh, relay that to people like, well, I know what my limits are. And so this is just beyond my limit of being able to have a productive conversation. And so I try, I try to communicate that whenever I can. How do you select which videos or which people you're going to engage with or, or which you know, video diaries that you're, you're, you're going to rebut? Like no matter what the subject area, there's going to be, uh, people defending a particular position that uh, are going to use bad arguments, including those with positions you agree with, as well as those that you don't. So, how do you how do, how do you choose? Do you try and find like the the best, most cogent arguments defending the existence of God or Christianity, or the the best arguments against atheism, or do you do you look for the craziest, wild ones that are just going to be incredibly entertaining to? dissect and and tear apart well uh, i guess that's the good thing about my channel uh, that i try to do with my channel is i try not to hyper focus in on one type of of content i guess it's it, i i usually cycle through things so like um i i have plenty of videos on my channel where i do tackle like the the uh, I, I guess the more sophisticated popular arguments uh, like from William Lane Craig, uh, Frank Turek is up there. People, you know, really like Frank Turek, or at least they, they feel like he's um, a good representation of the professional, like Christians, I guess. Um, but, you know, you've got Frank Turek, uh, William Lane Craig. I've got um, rebuttals of, of different scholars that directly work in 
uh, you know, the, the field of philosophy as, as it's concerned with, you know, God. I, I have those videos, but then I also want to, I, I like getting on the personal level of finding, you know, just sort of the, the random Christian that has put out a video where they are like, I don't know why they think God doesn't exist, you know, and, and then here are my reasons why it confuses me. And so sometimes those videos can be very thought provoking and, uh, you know, I, I have a good chance to really engage with new ideas or at least new questions posed towards atheists. And then some are just straight up hilarious. <laughs> um, cause, uh, there's a, a recent video that I had, um, I had edited together from a live stream that I did was uh, a guy going through like 10 reasons uh, why atheists exist. Right. And it's like, uh, I think the number six reason was that atheists are haunted by demons and there's no, like, there's no real rebuttal to that, you know, <laughs> it, other than, other than just saying, you know, we're not. and so it, you know, I, I tend to end up having fun with, with, content like that and I, I feel like blowing off steam and having fun with that kind of content not not uh, you know trying to get people to go and harass this person or anything like that but just have fun with the concept of you know people just not understanding why atheists are atheists and then just making up wild reasons as to why they are and uh, I think I think having fun with that kind of, of content um, is it can be fun son sometimes um, it, there for a while on my channel. I did kind of get into the hole. I, I call it a hole of like dealing with um, some of the wilder anti-science uh, people, which would be like flat earthers and stuff. And um, I kind of got sucked into, I guess, the more toxic form of rebuttal and critique of, of people's ideas. And, um, I'm not exactly proud of, of that particular set of content that I was in for a while. Um, and I, I, I definitely think that even though I was kind of harsh in that kind of content, I think that I was the least harsh out of everybody that was like doing content. Well, I guess maybe one of the least harsh, uh, cause there, there were a lot of creators out there that were being, um, very harsh, uh, to, to that particular group. Um, and it was easy to get sucked into that. And, you know, I kind of, uh, snapped out of it and I, I focused away from that kind of content. And I really started to hyper-focus in on, you know, the atheist activism that I had really, uh, grown my channel doing. And, um, uh, I hyper focused in on that and I really wanted to, um, you know, showcase good conversations. And that's why I pick from a wide range of video uh, styles, video topics and different groups that are putting videos out there. Like whether that be the uh, scholarly group that, um, you know, makes all these, um, you know, videos uh, putting out different arguments for God. Uh, like William Lane Craig has a lot of great, um, animated videos where they they put forth all these ideas and the production value is awesome and the arguments are you know some of the better christian arguments i guess or at least religious arguments and um but then there are other people that are, are just regular people that sit down in front of their camera and talk about what they think and i try to um i i guess i try to be a, a little bit kinder with some of those people than I am with the professional um, religious apologists. But uh, I feel like addressing, uh, you know, every facet is kind of an important thing to do because you never know when somebody's going to find one of your videos. It could be a brand new atheist or it could be somebody that's kind of questioning their beliefs or something like that. And I never know when um, somebody's going to find it. And um, that's why I try to pull from the vast vastly different sources because everybody has an idea of what's low hanging fruit. You know, everybody has an idea of, of, well, this person's not really all that 
um, uh, credible as an apologist or this person. And, and, and so given that, I try to pull from, you know, various sources. Yeah. One of the things that you said earlier that really resonates with me is that like to the extent that a person's beliefs does not fit, does, does not com- com- comport with reality, they, there's a potential real problem. It was about a dozen years ago uh, when I fell into the anti-vax rabbit hole for the first time without knowing that was a thing. I mean, it was a dozen years ago and I, I didn't know that that was a thing. And I, it was, it was quite the eye opening, uh, quite the eye opening experience. And in fact, that's what, that was, uh, the result of that was what I, uh, why I started my blog was just to get some of my, my thoughts and writings out there in the hopes that it could reach other people who might be, might be thinking about these things and they can see some of the, the counter arguments to the common anti-vax sentiment. I don't. I don't want to, uh, you know, dox you or out you, but I think it's public knowledge that you live in the Bible Belt of of the United States. Has your outspoken activism led to any negative or or, or positive consequences in your community or in your career? Um. Well, not not exactly. Um. So. Basically, when um, when I first started really doing the whole activism thing um, a, a lot and, and being more vocal about you know what I believed and everything, uh, at work I was I was working with a group of of developers and uh, occasionally they would you know group up and they'd talk about something, and I noticed that every time that I got in there and I started talking about things, um, it would always end in somebody getting uh, irately mad at me and it wasn't because i was saying like it wasn't it wasn't because i was being like the energetic kind of uh john that you see on camera and being very um i guess antagonistic it was uh you know i remember one discussion vividly where um the i don't know how the conversation was going exactly uh, i i remember it being a cordial conversation until the very end when one of the guys just screams at the top of his lung. I don't want no LGBT gay boy scout master to teach my son or something like that. And uh, it, it, that's, that's when I left the conversation. Like it, he was, he was basically screaming that he didn't want a gay scout leader teaching his son things. And, um, I was sitting there and I was, I was politely defending, you know, uh, the, the LGBTQ, uh, people. And, um, it, you know, it, he just got irately mad at me about it. And, uh, there was another time when another coworker was having a conversation with me and, um, I can't remember what was said, but he got a little, you know, irrationally angry with me too. And he ended up having to come back and apologize to me at the behest of like the team leads that I was on. And so uh, I, I kind of, I guess I kind of learned quickly that I probably shouldn't be discussing my worldview at work. Not, not because of, you know, the fact that I was like, I, I guess, timid about supporting my position or anything like that, but that, you know, it, it, it causes problems. And it's not that I think that people shouldn't speak up like at work or in conversations with people. I think that you have to make the decision for yourself. Like, do you think that you can, you know, talk about these things at work without jeopardizing your position or jeopardizing your job? I don't think that my job was ever in jeopardy, but I do think that I was making um, the work environment harder for my coworkers by having such a differing opinion. And so I just sort of had to, you know, not necessarily stop using my voice at that point, but I had to selectively use it and selectively join conversations. So I did feel somewhat restricted and it's because I live, I I mean, I live in North Alabama and that doesn't make it easy. Uh, because, you know, I have so many family members that are uh, very religious. They, um, you know, since they have learned that I'm not religious anymore, 
um, they have uh, opted not to speak about religion with me. And, um, you know, as, as much as I hate that they made that decision, that seems to be the best decision for them is, you know, I, I, you know, in order for us to, you know, remain, I guess, in, in communication, I just can't speak with you about religion. And so, you know, I've, I've respected that. Uh, I think that that's the kind of conversation that people need to have with their family members, like, you know, whether or not to continue having those kind of conversations or, uh, whether to make that sort of an off limits topic. Uh, that's a very important conversation to have with people. Uh, and um, it's very important to respect that boundary line, Wh wherever you happen to draw it, it's very important to respect it. Um, but uh, I, you know, here, here, where I'm at is a pretty liberal place, uh, even though it's, it's fairly conservative too. It's also fairly liberal. And so after that initial, like I was, I was surrounded by essentially all Republicans at that point that were very conservative, very Christian and everything. But since that point, I have not really encountered a lot of pushback. Like whenever I've been in conversations or, you know, I, I talk about those kinds of things. Um, I haven't experienced that, but the rest of the area is actually pr still pretty conservative and people still have to watch what they say. So it's a very interesting balancing act in, you know, when to talk about it, when not to, and uh, having to make that decision for your own situation is very important. But I still like to advocate for people to, this is my tagline that I say in every video, to stand up and use your voice. I, I still think that it's very important to do that. But the the point is is to you know use your voice and speak up when you can when you feel like you're able to definitely speak up and use your voice what, what advice based on your decade of experience would you give to people who want their voices to be heard i mean that's it, a fairly common question that i get uh, a lot of the time and honestly i think the hardest hurdle to get over is just you know, sitting down and, and doing it, um, you know, so like knowing what kind of content that you want to make or what kind of video you want to respond to or whatever. Um, and then being, and, and then being able to just sit down and do it. And, uh, I get a lot of people that, um, that, that want to sort of, I guess, make activism like the thing that they do like that, like that's, that's the thing that I do. When I started, um, and this is just from my own experience, when I started, and even still today, I do it because it's something that I want to do. Like, I watch a video, and I feel like I have something to say. Whether or not somebody has said it before doesn't matter, because I can guarantee you, whatever position you have, somebody has already said it. But the point is, is that you're adding your voice to the mix. Like, you're... you're you're uh, putting yourself out there, whether that's behind like an avatar, like plenty of creators do, like, you know, Paula Gia does, uh, Vice Rhino does, or um, uh, a new creator, P Professor Plink uh, is, is what he goes by. Um, all of those creators do it behind avatars. So their face like isn't on camera and it's very easy production wise in order to, you know, uh, get that kind of content out there. The fact is, is that uh, regardless of whether or not somebody's already said what you've said, it still matters that you're saying it. It still matters that you're putting in the time to put those kinds of videos together and to get your voice out there. Um, and that seems to be the biggest hurdle for a lot of people is that they feel rather apathetic about it. Like they, they feel apathetic about, you know, saying something that's been said several times, but you don't know what's going to resonate with somebody. You don't know if the way that you think about something, while not all that different from how other people have put it, it might resonate with somebody out there. And I've, I've heard, you know, so many uh, creators out there that have, um, you know, uh, touched uh, people's lives in a way that has uh, changed their worldview. And it's not that the the person was saying anything different from what's already been said. 
It's just that that creator's words uh, of either encouragement or entertainment or education have reached somebody at a point in their life where it has affected them in a positive way. I've got, I've myself have gotten many messages that have conveyed that very message that, you know, they, uh, you know, found themselves questioning something or being in a spot where they just weren't sure. And then they found my videos amongst other people's videos. And it really helped guide them in the way that they now currently view the world. And so you never know if your video is going to touch somebody in that kind of way. Or um, if it's just going to, you know, vanish into, into the ether. But the point is, is that it's something that you want to do. You want to add your voice to it. And as long as that's the reason why you're doing it, not because you want to be internet famous or not because you want to, you know, gr- uh, have this hugely popular channel. Um, it's because that's the thing that you want to do. Like that, that's your drive. That's your passion. Uh, and you don't have to have like that passion a hundred percent of the time. You could see a dumb video, want to say something about it and you put it together and you put it out there. Um, you know, it, it, as long as you're standing up and using your voice for what you believe in, um, I think that it's always going to be important. And, but that's the biggest hurdle that people have is actually doing it. I'm sure that this conversation is going to spark some interest in what you have to say. If people want to find you online, where should they go? Well, uh, pretty much any social media platform except for Truth Social, I'm pretty much on <laughs> um, as Godless Engineer. Uh, and uh, you could, uh, if you type in Godless Engineer to any of those places, you'll be able to find me. YouTube's my main uh, sort of place where I post things. Uh, we, we do have a, a fairly large, uh, Facebook page, uh, at facebook.com, uh, godless engineering, uh, is where you can find us there. And then, um, you know, I've got a TikTok, I've got Twitter, uh, I've got, you know, several of those, uh, Instagram is another place, just godless engineer anywhere. So if you want to contact me, uh, you know, I'm, uh, my email is just John at godless engineering.com. If you want to have a more, uh, I guess, private conversation. I can't guarantee that I'll respond quickly, but I do try to respond to all um, uh, all emails that I do get. So uh, I'm very open to conversing with people and talking with people and everything like that. Well, John, this has been great. Thank you very much. Any Any final thoughts? Well, you know, I hope I didn't ramble too much. I, whenever I start talking about the, some of these topics, I tend to ramble. I hope I didn't ramble too much and, and bore a lot of people. But, um, uh, you know, uh, as far as final thoughts go, I just hope that everybody, you know, um, stands up and uses their voice for their positions. And I, I usually say that that's regardless of whether or not you're religious or not. I just, I, uh, I really hope that the far right conservative Christians here in America stop doing it a little bit, but uh, ultimately I hope that people stand up, use their voice and uh, you, you know, don't be afraid of defending your position. Uh, I think that's important. You're clearly passionate about that topic and that passion shines through. I don't think people are going to be bored. John, Gleason, <laughs> thank you so much for coming today on podcast for inquiry. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. And um, yeah, I, uh, thank you so much for having me on. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada. We rely entirely on donations to be your voice supporting science, free inquiry, critical thinking, and secularism here in Canada. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation today at centreforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member for only $30 per year at centreforinquiry.ca slash donate join. 
Your contribution supports our efforts to have reason and evidence drive decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Matt Payne, Nikolay Nikitushkin, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time.